Hello everybody and welcome back to Marriage and Kinship. Today we are going to be talking about marriage, adoption, care, and creativity. And this is the part in the semester where things are going to start to get a little bit weird. So buckle up. In the past, we have talked about historically varying attitudes about love which have originated largely in the West, but have been exported elsewhere. We've asked questions like, what is the relationship between love and marriage? And Giddens gives us three answers, which is one, that love is disruptive to marriage, or foundational to marriage, or irrelevant because why would you get married when love is fragile and relationships are impermanent? And we have also asked, what is the relationship between sex and marriage? We've talked about it being more fun outside of marriage within the context of passionate love. Of course, it's present within for reproductive purposes, but the fun sex is adulterous. We've talked about it as an expression of the love the marriage is built on, both in Giddens' concept of romantic love and in the concept of companionate love, as discussed by Hirsch and Wardlow. And we've also talked about it being one of many potential acts of intimacy and vulnerability within the context of a pure relationship. Now, as some of you have noticed, all of these concepts pertain to Europe. So let's see if we can zoom out and kind of look at the bigger anthropological picture about marriage. Marriage has been used for a lot of things by different people in different times and places and it's actually really hard to sort of summarize all the things that marriage can be and can do. People have used it for economic security, They've used it for alliances between families and the economic benefits that follow. So economic security and alliance are pretty intimately entangled. People have used it for personal emotional fulfillment and sexual satisfaction. But at the same time, none of these have to be the result of marriage. You can make a relatively useless alliance. You can be the economically secure one who's helping other people. <laughs> um, in lots of times, marriage is not emotionally or sexually fulfilling. That's something that people find elsewhere. So if we were trying to say, define marriage. What could we say marriage actually is or does and what conclusions can we draw? So, okay, ultimately it's really hard to define and sum up marriage because it does a lot of things but it doesn't have to do anything. But one thing that we can say for sure is that it creates a durable, socially recognized bond between people. That's it. <laughs> Actually, that's pretty much all that we can universally say that marriage does. Marriage may also legitimate and regulate sexual activity, childbearing, and child care. It can create economic and emotional linkages between different kin groups, this uh, alliance thing we've been going on about. And it can give either or both spouses rights to each other's labor or property. But it's really important to also keep in mind that marriage doesn't have to do any of these things other than just create that bond. Sex and procreation are separate in humans. And we know this from the biology of humans. Um, humans have this thing called concealed ovulation where people who are ovulating don't know that they're ovulating very often and certainly the people around them don't know that they're ovulating. So 
if you don't know when somebody is ovulating, when somebody is fertile, you cannot specifically plan to have procreative sex with that person. And this means that the reasons we have sex have to be detached from procreation. They cannot ever be purely procreative. Childcare is often the province of kin groups or society, broadly speaking, rather than just couples. And if we agree with Levi Strauss, love marriage is a pretty unstable foundation for durable alliances between families because love doesn't always last. So when we confront the fact that marriage is actually about a lot of different things, is marriage then actually useful to talk about anthropologically? And if it's not about alliance or about descent, then how can we understand it if we have to throw away this like century of anthropological writing about it? So John Borneman has some answers for us. One of his suggestions is basically, what if we stopped taking the structure of kinship or gender or power or anything else, actually? What if we stopped taking these structures for granted and looked instead at how the structure is used by people? He also asks, what if we looked at relationships of care and how they are enabled or permitted within a variety of structures? What if kinship is about who you care for and then how you get social structures to recognize and legitimate the fact that you care for them? So Borneman suggests that Care is actually an elementary principle of human affiliation, the need to care and also to receive care, to be cared for. So in order to look at this, he gives us two case studies. The first one is adoption. And he suggests that we think about adoption as a social agreement to have a pseudo descent relationship. So one thing that I'd like to hear from you is what does it mean to have a relationship similar to that between a biological father and his son, or more generally between a biological parent and child of any gender? By contrast, what does it mean to have a relationship that is like a marriage? And so then what do you do with a relationship that doesn't fit into any understood categories. If we think that Harold and Dieter love each other and are entitled to care for each other, how do we get their care relationship recognized so that, for example, Dieter can inherit Harold's estate when Harold dies? And we have this really fascinating quote from Borneman um, where he tells us that Dieter's mother thought through analogy that the relationship between the two men looked like a marriage. But the mother's analogy with affinity was not supposed to be the primary issue for the court who was deciding whether these two men could be related, for the judge was being asked to think through a relationship of descent. Descent between the two men, unlike marriage, which is supposed to be structurally heterosexual, right? Descent between the two men was indeed imaginable and representable, but only after the judge first established respect for the incest taboo. So this essential bit of information, denial of sex between the two men, had to be created as a public secret by the court so that their relationship matched a parent-child relationship better. So... Again, we have this question of how do you get social permission to care about someone and to give them kinship rights in your life? Like, for example, the right to make decisions in case of illness or incapacitation, the right to share or inherit property, other kinship rights. 
So what happens is these two men wind up pursuing a legal adoption wherein the older one adopts the younger, not because they actually have a parent-child relationship, but because it seems like a plausible way to get their relationship recognized. So Borneman tells us once the petition was granted and the adoption approved, the initial legal kinship logic had been effectively stretched out of recognizable shape. In fact, a new principle of kinship was at work, and that principle is care. All right, so our second case study involves marriage, where we have two women and one of their sons. And so you have a lesbian relationship, but you need that lesbian relationship or some kind of kinship tie between these women to be recognized legally in part so that one of them could migrate to East Germany to live with the other. So again, how does the law recognize the right of people who care about each other as enshrined in legal relationships of affiliation, that is marriage, to be together? We think that married couples have a right to be together and thus migrate together. Spousal visas are a thing. But if you have a relationship that cannot be legally recognized, for example, because same-sex marriage isn't legal, how do you create the kinds of relationships that you would need in order to get that legal thing that you also need, a visa? So Borneman says relations of affinity based on care alone without recourse to the incest taboo and the separation of descent from affinity are neither articulable nor representable in anthropological categories as they have existed up until the end of the 20th century. And he suggests that marriage, like adoption, is undergoing some fundamental changes in practice. As the legal tool of marriage is stretched to fit and made to serve the practical goals and situations of actual and diverse peoples, in particular to foreground the needs of caring, it undermines its traditional institutional purposes. So if marriage is supposed to be about alliance and then the creation of dissent relationships through alliance, marriage and then procreation, then this situation where you have a lesbian marrying her partner's son in order to create legal relationships that can be the basis for the rights that we associate with caring for another person so that they can be together so that the other woman can migrate. That's, that's not what marriage is traditionally imagined to be for. That's certainly not what East German lawmakers imagined people using marriage laws for. But if we accept that care and the recognition of care is really the important structuring principle behind kinship, then it becomes much less strange. In conclusion, Borneman tells us that he is committed to a kind of anthropological endeavor that questions the equation of conventionally accepted norms, such as descent and affinity, with a human core or foundation. He thinks that humanity is not well represented by charts. <laughs> And so he says he's focused on how these normative frameworks are institutionalized in marriage and kinship and institutionalized in laws that govern marriage and kinship are produced in time by acts of exclusion and how the excluded, basically in this context, gay people, nonetheless find the means to articulate their needs and get their relationships recognized. Finally, he says, I assert the priority of an ontological process to care and be cared for as a fundamental human need and nascent right. And he suggests that this might seem deceptively simple, but maybe we have to let things be deceptively 
simple rather than focusing on trying to produce this kind of symmetrical, beautiful system and let humans define care for themselves. So thank you very much for joining me and I'll talk to you virtually next time.